Hello. Welcome to Tuesday. It's day two of our Pollinator Power Party. If you join us for one hour a day for five days in a row, I guarantee that you're going to walk away inspired. Um, so today we have our Gardening Culture and Equity Day. We have some phenomenal content to cover. Um, and I just wanted to start with a little bit of background. We got questions um, yesterday on day one of the party about um, sort of what inspired the Pollinator Power Party and what's the deal with the Electric Power Research Institute sort of running this event. Um, so just a, a bit of background, um, EPRI is a nonprofit research institute and we run an initiative called the Power and Pollinator Initiative. It's the largest uh, collaborative initiative where power companies are coming together to do shared research and have conversations about how they intersect with pollinators. And um, it might sort of seem like a, a strange connection at first. You know, electric power companies, what are they doing related to pollinators? But if you think about it for just a minute or two, um, you realize that the amount of land that power companies have um, management responsibility for is massive um, across around the world. You know, you're talking millions and millions of acres of land and habitat. And so um, there's a strong intersection with a number of environmental issues. And one of them is pollinators. Um, and so this is a very active uh, research area for APRI um, related to what do we do on the ground? What can companies do? How do you make the business case? And part of that is also helping companies think about how they're communicating and how they're engaging their customers and their shareholders and investors related to this topic of pollinators. Um, and so we started helping companies sort of engage on this public communication front. And when COVID hit, um, all of the local place-based activities that companies were doing um, didn't happen anymore because everybody was locked down. And EPRI sort of said, hey, you know, how about we do a large, everybody come together and we do a large virtual party. And so really this party is born out of the COVID lockdown. Um, and we're just so happy that all the companies are, are here and these are the organizations. There's about 30 of them and you can check on our event site. All, all of them are listed there. So I just want to do a shout out to them and just say, you know, thank you for making the party possible. Um, and allowing um, so much outreach and, and public education about pollinators to take place. Okay, so if you registered for the party, um, I encourage everybody to register because you get a couple things in the mail, a, part, a, a party engagement package, which includes a party agenda. We have um, some scientific identification guides. This year we published our Lepidoptera guide. Last year was uh, the bee identification guide. And you get to chat um, with all of the speakers every day. Um, yesterday there's daily prize drawings. Yesterday I'll announce David Owens. Congratulations, David won uh, the poster, which is um, a really beautiful poster that Pollinator Partnership published. We're going to send you a poster. And then Kathleen Morganson won um, two scientific identification guides. One, our uh, laminated Lepidoptera guide, which you'll learn about on Thursday. Lepidoptera is um, butterflies and moths. And then also our bee guide. Shout out uh, to uh, Kennedy. Um, who's posting on our hashtag all the pictures of what she's doing on the origami folding. She posted a question for a Mythbusters on Friday. So good job. I just wanted to shout out to you. The hashtag is at Alorophile3. So awesome. Um, anybody that posts to our hashtag, get up there and start communicating. If you join every day this week, you will also be entered to win autographed books. One of them is this really awesome one, Gardening for Butterflies um, from the Xerces Society. And another is Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. All right, so um, so for today, yesterday the chat was was awesome. It was kind of off the charts. Um, if, you, if you're logged into the event, you can engage in the chat again today. It's in the upper right-hand side of, uh, of your, of your um, screen. Also, we posted four polling questions. 
We have four questions. We ask you a few thoughts about pollinators um, that are related to today's um, keynote speakers. And at the end, we're going to see uh, how you guys collectively answer these polling questions. I think we're going to get I don't know, we might get 600 people answering these questions. So get in there, answer the polls. Don't be shy, engage. I know some of you guys are shy out there. I am too. Don't worry about it. Just engage, take the polls, start chatting. Um, okay, so for today, a really special day today in content, um, gardening culture and equity. We have um, speakers that kind of cover both rural uh, Oklahoma settings, all the way to uh, urban story in downtown Oakland, California. Um, and thinking about how um, pollinators and native plants and seeds are um, important culturally um, and in people's daily lives, not only for the food that we eat, which we have been talking about, we discussed that a bit yesterday, but also for our, um, our emotional health and well being as well. Um, and this link, we're, we'll talk about it again tomorrow and on Thursday, the link between pollinators and um, equity is really important. It's not just that, um, that everybody eats food. It's that um, everybody um, ideally is within a walking distance of a natural area, that that is a, a right um, and a need for people emotionally to spend time outside and in nature. Um, and if pollinators are in decline, it affects many things. Um, and the folks that will have the hardest time absorbing the impacts of that for access to affordable and clean food and alternative food options and access to nature are the ones that are least able to, um, to respond to adjusting to buying different food sources, to taking a train to a natural area rather than being able to walk. So um, this is a really important topic and um, something that we wanted to take a day to kind of discuss and highlight here. So we're going to talk about this through the storytelling that we're going to do today. And we have a really beautiful opening. Uh, we have a song, a, a blessing from a tribal elder leader um, that offered this to us um, to open our pollinator party. So we're going to start with that opening song. It's called the Mother Earth Song by our tribal leader. Um, all right, so let's get this party started. Come back, stay on, and we're going to do the polls and chat at the end. See you soon. For us, our songs and our stories are part of a prayer. And so what I'd like to offer today is our Mother Earth song. And this song just thanks our Earth Mother for everything she gives us to survive, the water, the food, the air. We could not have anything, we could not live without our Earth Mother. Mm. 
Mi hija, my name is Tina Orduno Calderon. I'm Gabrielino Tongba, Ventureño Chumash, and Yoeme. Pollinators, like all animals, are extremely important to our tribe. We didn't separate ourselves from the nature, so we think of them as relatives, and relatives that have a very specific job, a very important job. Um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have our food sources, and um, the animals wouldn't have their food sources as well. And I like to think of certain pollinators that other people don't maybe always think of. Um, for instance, the yucca has a moth that is its only pollinator, and they have such a reciprocal relationship where they need each other to survive. So that's the kind of thing that pollinators show us, that beauty, that reciprocity. Pollinators for us um, are just as important as any other being. And so we think of them, yes, when they're doing their job, when we're harvesting, we're giving our thanks. Um, you can't say that they're like on our mind 24-7, right? Because there's so many things that we have to deal with just like everybody else. But absolutely that we include them in our family um, prayers. Your pollinator is the lesser long-nosed bat, Leptonycteris curosoa yerbabuena. Turns out, we wouldn't have tequila without the lesser long-nosed bat. In fact, this bat is one of three North American species that feed on nectar, a food source that leads them to travel hundreds of miles from central Mexico to as far north as Arizona and New Mexico. Without these amazing migratory creatures, many recognizable cacti and succulents wouldn't get pollinated, such as blue agave, the plant used to make tequila. There's also the saguaro cactus, which is found in the Sonoran Desert of Mexico, where the white flowers of the cactus bloom for only one night out of the year to attract these bats for pollination. True to their name, the lesser long-nosed bats use their lengthy snout, almost as long as their bodies, to reach deep down into blossoms for nectar, dusting themselves with pollen in the process. And once the blossoms close up by the following afternoon, other pollinators, such as wasps, bees, and birds, feed on any remaining nectar and pollen. For such an important role in the desert ecosystem, lesser long-nosed bats once faced a threat of extinction in the 1980s, possibly due to the fact that cacti and agave flowers were becoming harder to find, as tequila makers increasingly relied on cloning plants, cutting out the need for bats. That was until 2015, when conservation efforts in Mexico led to the removal of these bats from the country's endangered species list, followed by the United States in 2018. Now, these guys are thriving. Hello, pollinator people. My name is Lou Payne. I'm the right-of-way manager at the New York Power Authority. We're a state-owned transmission utility company. Our system is 1,400 miles or approximately 23,000 acres. My project that I want to share with you today is how I manage these right-of-ways utilizing integrated vegetation management with pollinators in mind. So come along with me and let's take a look. Integrated Vegetation Management, or IVM, is a system of managing plant communities. IVM controls non-compatible or tall growing vegetation while at the same time encouraging compatible or low growing vegetation. Simply put, the New York Power Authority, or NIPA, is managing vegetation with vegetation. NIPA is promoting compatible plants to grow on the rights of way. You can see there are shrubs, herbs, grasses, forbs, and ferns. These are the plants that bloom throughout the growing season. And these are the plants that draw in both pollinators and other wildlife. Pollinators love our rights of way. You can see this bee on the blossoms on this apple tree. This bee actually came in and checked our, out our drone before we took flight to make this video. To promote pollinators with NIPA's Integrated Vegetation Management, or IVM, approach, 
we have guidance steps which we follow. We assess our resources, we look at landscape considerations, we ensure there are abundant floral resources, we try to keep a mix of shrubs on the right of way, roughly around 30 to 40 percent. We select a treatment method to target the non-compatible vegetation, just like we're doing here. And most importantly, we monitor our progress, we evaluate this progress, and then we improve where necessary. When you piece all the components of IVM together with a focus on pollinators, this is what you're going to achieve. Again, managing vegetation with vegetation. Focus on this abundance and richness of the compatible vegetation. This becomes your biological control. NIPA's IVM program has opened the door for pollinators to exist statewide all across the New York Power Authority's transmission rights of way. Continuing to keep pollinators in mind throughout the vegetation management process, the possibilities are endless. Thank you for taking the time today to look at my integrated vegetation management program. I hope you enjoyed how we're keeping pollinators out on our rights of way. Happy Pollinator Week! Hi everyone, my name is Wes Graham. I'm the right away manager and field biologist for Cooperative Energy in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We're the transmission and generation arm of uh, the co-ops here in the state. We serve 11 distribution co-op members. Um, <clears throat> today, just kind of giving you just a quick tour of some of our transmission line and just give you a quick uh, overview of where we were and where we are today. When I first started 17 years ago, um, they mowed every four years. And so we wanted to get away from the use of heavy equipment. We brought in a uh, herbicide, uh, designed a program that would be beneficial for us, the landowner, as well as the wildlife. And we were trying to create a habitat that would conduce it for not only the wildlife, but for pollinator habitat as well. Well before the buzz phrase pollinator habitat uh, was as big as it is right now, okay? so. We introduced IVM techniques. You all know what that is. About 12 years ago, being a, growing up on a farm and being in row cropping, that's something that I kind of brought to the table. And then when we're in the transition period right now. We're, we're in early spring. We've had a wet spring. You see everything greening up. Um, but this line was treated last year. We use a directed low volume backpack spray so that we can concentrate our efforts on the undesirable vegetation, which is the woody species primarily, and, uh, and leave everything else, creating that herbaceous environment that you see today. The aster, we're having some wildflowers starting to, uh, starting to bloom. You see some young pine seedlings that are, are green growing, but then from last year's herbicide application, you see the young uh, saplings that were uh, had germinated last year, they're get, we're getting good control from those. Sweet gum, and you, we got good control over it. So we definitely want to remove these from the right of way because that can affect our reliability. This is what we want to see. This is what we do see. Hey, happy pollinator week. Y'all have a great one. We'll see y'all soon. So Darylin began its environmental stewardship program back in 1994 and the establishment of the native prairie here at our Genoa site um, was one of the, the main components of that. And a lot of folks will ask, well, why does Darylin do these things? Why is it important to Darylin Project? So it's really good from a community relations standpoint and, and educating people in the community on the importance of pollinator habitat and the 
the plight of the pollinators and it's really been a, a really good marriage between industry and conservation with what Dairyland's done. So at that time, uh, we did a little out of the box thinking. We talked to Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and told them what we'd really like to do is to seed it with the variety of different prairie grasses and forbs and establish a, a natural prairie. We've got a really nice mature prairie out here, uh, provides habitat for you know, a number of different birds. Uh, there's a number of insects and butterflies. Uh, so it's been a really good project. My name is Ben Campbell and I'm an environmental biologist with Dairyland Power. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our bluff prairie habitat. In 2018 we entered 110 of acres of that bluff land into a conservation easement with a local conservation group. If you remove the nuisance species, the grass and the pollinator plants and habitat will grow. So we want to go in and cut and remove those trees, open the prairie up, so that the natural seed bank that's already there will start growing and producing pollinator habitat. We have done several burns on the site. Um, several years ago we conducted a burn just to help widen out that prairie some more. Since 2007 we put in about five acres of habitat at three different substations uh, with the idea of instead of doing mowing and just putting in a lot of maintenance otherwise into it, we would develop it into a pollinator habitat or a pollinator plot. Uh, one problem that we have at these sites, since it's close to residential area, we'll actually get people throwing their yard waste into our prairie, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize the grass clippings and potential grass seed comes right back in and we're trying to get rid of that. So that's been some growing pains with just the patience and it takes three to five years to get your prairie looking good. So what we've talked about today mostly focuses on specific projects that Dairyland's actively managing for pollinator habitat. You know, we do have power purchase agreements with several solar farms or solar arrays and usually when we enter into a power purchase agreement with those entities we like to make sure that they're gonna have so many acres of pollinator habitat and that they have a management plan associated uh, with their solar farm. One of the species that has really uh, gotten a lot of press the last few years has been the monarch butterfly and we've seen a, a really large decline in the breeding population of monarchs the last few years and that's where an effort like this really comes into play. Uh, we've got a number of milkweeds that are planted out here. Uh, we see a number of monarchs every year, so um, this is a really good, good tool and something that people can do on their own. Um, that you don't need to do a big, you know, large scale uh, pollinator plot like this. This is something that you can do in your, your own backyard, put in uh, a few nectar plants and then get some milkweed in there. and. Um, you know, the habitat like that certainly benefits the monarch butterfly, but there's also so many other species uh, that can benefit from that. Uh, one that we've got in this area is the rusty patch bumblebee. That's another listed species that, again, these pollinator habitats are very valuable for. So something that really anybody can get involved in and, and do on a small scale on your own property as well. When I started at Dairyland, I never thought that part of my job would be involved with stewardship programs such as working on restoring pollinator habitat. I had no experience with pollinators and really not much information. And since being part of Dairyland and working with EPRI as one of our founding men members of the Power and Pollinators program, I've learned a lot about pollinators and hope to learn a lot more. There's certain permits that and compliance actions that uh, utilities like Dairyland have to abide by and, and things that we have to do. But these projects go above and beyond that and that's the question that we get well what are you doing above and beyond what you're required to do and that's where projects like the pollinator plots come in so it's really um, in the end been a nice marriage between industry and conservation with with some of the activities that we do like this we're really lucky here at Dairyland that they allow us to do stewardship programs you know all the stuff we mentioned today and we have other stewardship programs that we're not required to do by any federal or state law, we're not required to do any of it, but we'd like to go above and beyond and do something for the environment in the communities that we do business. So we're lucky that Dairyland supports that. We have great management that allows us to continue doing the work and also to look for new opportunities to do stewardship in the communities that we serve. Good morning, I'm Jessica Fox. I'm here in downtown Oakland, California, 
And today we're going to be telling the story about the Pollinator Posse, um, which is a, a, a nonprofit volunteer run group that's trying to basically spread the word about um, pollinators and pollinator habitat through the urban jungle. So we're gonna be walking through the special garden and uh, let's go take a look. As a park supervisor, um, I got this garden in 2010. I am, and I have this garden and a hundred other locations in Oakland, but I started you know, learning more about pollinators at Merritt College. I went to a couple butterfly gardening seminars up there and I watched the movie Queen of the Sun and I thought and I realized I woke up literally with an epiphany saying oh my god it's not farmers and pesticides it's it's us it's landscapers it's humans and how we look at landscapes hmm. and how we're t making everything aesthetically pleasing to humans and wiping out our ecosystems and because I work here I have thousands of volunteers I have staff that's affecting it I decided I had to be the one Mm. I had to get loud, and so I did. The first step I did was add more pollinator habitat, but and also making the bee hotel. We got the the habitat sign from National Wildlife Federation, and they loved that. We got the mayor to take the monarch's um, mayor's monarch pledge at National Wildlife Federation, and then last year she declared May twenty second the Pollinator Posse Day in Oakland, and did it here. Darrell, you um. You have a little bit of backstory around sort of how you kind of came to the garden and what's a little bit of your story? Oh, wow, where do I start? Um, <laughs> you know, just, you know, being born and raised in Oakland, California, you know, it's a different scene. So, you know, like when you're born here, it's just like you're, you're exposed to different things. Let's just put it like that. So, you know, back in 2010, I came here as a part-timer after losing two brothers. So it's just like, you know, I was just like, foggy like you know like things were I was just looking at life different at the time um, I got called to the back of this garden one day at work um, by my supervisor Victoria Rocha and she's just like I want to show you something and I didn't know what she wanted to show me so at the time so so I came back here and she's just like she put this bug on me this at the time it's just a bug so I didn't know what it was you know I wasn't into it so I'm just freaking out I'm just like oh my god what is this and she's laughing, you know, she, so I'm just like, what's going on? She's like, it's just a caterpillar. So it's just a big hairy little thing. So turns out it was a monarch butterfly. It probably, you probably think I'm, you know, pulling your chain, but I was kind of scared of bugs. Like seriously, you know. Wait, wait, wait. You were scared of bugs? Yes. Look, look. He's a foot. foot. Which, how did you, you lost two brothers? Yes. How'd you lose your brothers? Gun violence. Uh, okay. yeah, gun violence, so, you know, just it's like it's normal growing up, you know, like like people normalize the wrong things like this should be normalized. Like, you know, like nature should be normalized, like like just understanding, like how we get oxygen and going down the line, like to seeing what pollinates the trees and what pollinates the fruit. You know, we're not taught things like that where I grew up at. So, you know, when when I ran into this lady, we call her her name is Victoria, but we call her Tora. So she doesn't mind. So when I ran to her, it was just like, I need this. Mm. They had a project down on the um, estuary, and they were they, there was all this fennel that they were all cutting down weeders. And so another employee told me that she didn't understand why Darrell said, "No, no, no, we can't do this fennel over here. We have to leave it for the butterflies." <laughs> and all the other employees are looking at him like, "What?" I just heard the story for the first time a month ago. Uh -huh. And so um, she's and then when I told her how I chased Darrell with the butterfly. And, yeah. and then he would come to my office. You chased Darrell with a butterfly? Yes. I did. Because <laughs> he, he wouldn't do it. I'm like, come here, let's release a butterfly. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And you know, and he was, I was like, dude, you're six and five. She, and she's just back here laughing. And I'm just like, what's the joke? <laughs> so. And then after that, he would come to my office when he come in at the end of the day and he's like, it got any more butterflies. And then, you know, you, you found that little boy and yep. he released Monarch, the little boy said, I'm afraid of bugs. Darrell told him a story. He's going through the same thing I was going through. So, and then he had him release it, and then the father is standing there, looking all like he was going to be too cool for right. the whole situation. And then he saw the kid release the butterfly, and then he's like, "Can I do that?" And so, and then you know, we built butterfly gardens with these families that came in here and it changed their life. It's not just about building it; mm. it's maintaining it. It's not over pruning it, over manicuring it. 
you know, people don't know that a lot of um, butterfly pupa, they'll drop to the ground and wrap themselves up in the leaf and wait out until spring. So they're raking their leaves or wiping out the whole generation of hair streaks. It's like uh, training the staff to just be gentler and that it actually, and then also, you know, do you, using signage um, so that I can change the perception of the public because the public would, you know, email me and say, why didn't you weed this area of Lake Merritt? You know, they'd, I'd get like 50 emails and then um, I'd put the sign out there. It said, pardon our weeds, it's pollinator habitat. The same 50 people would say, thank you for what right. you're doing. Uh-huh. So it's changing that perception. I never understood until she told me like what the bees do. You know, they're pollinators. Like without the bees, without without flies, seriously like flies, you like you'd be surprised like what they just pollinate. You know, our oxygen, our food supply, like it all comes from them, so mm. you know, without them like it'd be no us. You know, he told all the directors of Parks and Rec one day and he stood up in front of them and said that learning this changed his life, that if he researched something he can get over his fear of it. Yes. Now I'm just seeding the world. I was gonna pull up a picture to show you guys. So here's some of my seeds. I don't know if you guys can see. So I'm just like going through all the parts over in Oakland. I'm just seeding everything. Oh, wow. Yes, so they're yeah, blooming. Uh, he did that with the community. At first they teased him a little. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what'd you get teased about? What was that about? Just basically, you know, I'm just back here like looking for caterpillar eggs and just stuff like that. And they're just like, what are you doing? You know? Um, it was kind of weird to them because, like she said, you know, a lot of people's not into it. How do you shift gears and how does, how do you like prioritize coming and working in the garden and talking about nature and pollinators when you have all that going on? It's just like, you know, it's a whirlwind. It's, you know, it's hard, you know, because then I got my mom and like her only son left. So it's like, you got to balance all these things. And it's, you know, that's just put more stress on you. So it's just like you get overwhelmed real quick. So. Then you come in here into this garden and you look around and it's just like it's a breath of fresh air. Well, this used to be a long time ago. It was like a formium and the blue fescue bed, which and with gravel and weed cloth. And we all know now that weed cloth is bad. Native bees can't nest. So we scraped it. We're going to sift through this and then we're going to plant a meadow, a okay. wildflower meadow, because nobody's doing meadows like in urban settings. You don't ever see a lake. I go to other public gardens and they go oh there's the meadow it's a big lawn that they mow I'm like that's not a meadow <laughs> so we're gonna do a demonstration meadow here are we literally in, in the, the middle you're of in the heart Oakland? you are in the heart of the city literally yeah. and it's just not many cities have a lake right inside yeah. the city so it's this actually Lake Merritt is the very first wildlife sanctuary in the country wow. it's two years older than Yellowstone Wow. And because of the migratory birds that come through Lake Merritt, but they let all these high risers come up. So that was my main point is this is what we're how we're treating our oldest wildlife sanctuary. And that's why I needed to start creating wildlife habitat. I want to call myself a pollinator because <laughs> I'm just like pollinating where I come from. Like the guys, you know, that, you know, just trying to reach them, you know, like, you, hey, go to the, you know, it's free. You know, nature is free, you know, like it's like one of the only things that we got that's left, you know, that's free to enjoy, like, so. We really appreciate coming here to Oakland today and having you show us the garden and telling us the story of Pollinator Posse. And we hope everybody at the Pollinator Power Party 2022 appreciates the story and can help sort of translate this to um, some of their own communities and their own gardens. You don't have to be a master gardener. You don't even have to have studied biology. You can just get out put some native seeds on the ground and start talking to your friends about it. You are going to be an inspiration for a lot of other people. Thank you. You know, I'm planting wild seeds right now. You know, we call them the pollinator seeds. Got these little packs, you know, we just call them the pollinator seeds, it's just wildflowers. Uh -huh. And every time I get a bloom, I think about Tora. I just think about Victoria, you know, uh -huh. I text her and I'm just say, hey, I got a bloom. And it just reminds me of her uh -huh. because you know, like, I was in a dark place when I first met her. So now it's just like every time I see a bloom, I think of her. Because she helped me bloom. Like, it's just like I'm still blooming.
Hello, everyone. I am Feather Smith, the Cherokee Nation Ethnobiology Manager with the Office of the Secretary of Natural Resources. My presentation for the Pollinator Power Party today is titled Ethnobiology, which is the study of how people interact with their environments. Of course, today I will be focusing on how Cherokees interact with our environment. So Cherokee traditionalist Redbird Smith once said, no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch. This quote drives home just how important gardening was for the Cherokees. The Cherokee are considered a people of the Eastern deciduous forest. When we think about forests, we tend to think about trees, but in truth, trees are just a small part of the plant life within the forest. The small plants that thrive in a forest are oftentimes much more important for medicine and food than even some of the larger plants such as trees. This makes preserving natural forest ecosystems very important for cultural preservation. Oftentimes, government and corporate entities think that replacing a forest with just any trees, such as pine trees, replaces that forest. But this will actually completely change the entire ecosystem, such when we think about pines, how it tends to actually change the pH of the soil, it changes the way light filters through the uh, canopy. The plants that thrive in an eastern deciduous forest would never be able to grow in something like a pine forest. Prior to European contact and in, even into the 1800s, Cherokees lived in the southeastern United States. This territory sat in the middle of the eastern deciduous forest ecoregion. In the 1830s, Cherokees were forced along the Trail of Tears to move into Indian Territory. We settled in what is now present day Northeast Oklahoma. This area still sits on the fringe of the eastern deciduous forest and then is also in the cross timbers and the tall prairie, uh, tall grass prairie ecoregions. This means that much of the plant life that we were accustomed to in the southeast is still found in this area, but we did have to adapt to a new ecosystem and we lost some of the plants that were most important to us for medicine and for food. Adding to the eco shift and climate shift that we experienced during removal, we have had to continue to adapt to the climate shift since removal. So this slide shows the maximum and minimum temperatures in the Southeast homelands and in Oklahoma during the time of removal. We see that during removal, we had to adapt to warmer temperatures in Oklahoma, but today our maximum temperatures in Oklahoma are actually in excess of what's shown in the slide. We can get in excess of 100 degrees. These hot temperatures can make it tough for some plants to grow and they make it easier for others to thrive. So along with adapting to that eco shift and climate shift during removal, we've had to continue to do that during the time that we've lived here in Oklahoma as things have continued to warm up. The Cherokee Nation Seed Bank was started in 2006. Through the Cherokee Seed Bank, we are able to provide Cherokee heirloom seeds to Cherokee citizens as a way to preserve culture and heirloom genetics. So the seed bank was actually started as a need to preserve the genetics of historical Cherokee heirloom seeds. A conversation regarding the Cherokee purple tomato being placed in a famous seed vault resulted in research being done on traditional Cherokee crops. What was discovered, as many of us had already guessed, is that the Cherokee purple tomato is Cherokee in name only. It was not a seed that was cultivated by the tribe. We were able to learn about many Cherokee heirloom seeds that the tribe had cultivated. Many of those seeds predated European contact. And what we found was that no one in the world was growing those plants for preservation. This meant that many of these plants were at risk of being lost. So the Cherokee Nation created the heirloom garden as a way to grow these seeds that were unique to the tribe with genetic preservation in mind. Each year, seed stock is set aside from what is grown to serve as future genetic seed stock and then what we have in excess is then given to Cherokee citizens for free. Um, and those citizens are uh, any of the citizens from one of the three federally recognized Cherokee tribes. We now have over a dozen Cherokee heirloom crops being preserved at our site. We grow more than 100 native plants on site that are important for medicine, food, and utilitarian purposes. We are able to give many of these native plant seeds back through the seed bank as well. Cherokee heirloom crops were grown to provide food during the winter when the region couldn't be foraged for natural foods. Our corn and our bean crops were allowed to dry on the stalk and on the vine before being harvested, then shelled, dried, and afterwards being stored for the winter. 
the cucurbits or what's also known as beans and pumpkin varieties uh, will keep for several months once they're harvested, once they're pulled off the vines. And as long as they're stored in the right conditions, we'll pretty much keep all winter long. We grow four varieties of Cherokee corns. Pictured here are the Cherokee yellow, colored, and white flower corns. We often refer to corn as mother corn because it is considered the most important of our crops. This is primarily due to how easy corn is to grow and how reliable the crop is on giving us an abundant harvest. The Cherokee white eagle corn is our oldest variety of seed. It tends to grow uh, to about eight to 10 feet tall, although in Oklahoma, it is actually known to get even taller. It grows on a red cob and the kernels can range from sort of a purple or blue color into a white color into a yellow color. On a perfect cob, we're gonna see all three of those kernels present, but all of the purple or blue kernels would have this white eagle flying on the side of it. We grow corn and we grow beans together. All of our beans are pole beans as they need something to grow upon. We would plant our corn first, and then after it gets to be about six inches to about a foot tall, we would then plant the beans near the base of the corn. The beans will climb up the stalk and they're gonna to help to add structure to the corn stalk while also fixing nitrogen in the soil for the corn to feed on. Dog's head soup, which is mentioned on this slide, was a traditional meal made with pole beans. However, it was not made with dogs. We grow four varieties of Cherokee pole beans. The Georgia candy roaster squash is our most popular seed variety. It is a sweet winter squash that will keep for several months once harvested. Squash vines will branch along the ground in Cherokee gardens and they help to shade the soil with their overly large leaves. This is gonna help with moisture retention and it cuts down on weeds in the garden. The Cherokee tan pumpkin is our newest seed variety. We grew it for the first time in 2021. Our squash has not been a fan of Oklahoma heat and often uh, the squash and the beans require a lot of extra work to get those to thrive. However, the pumpkins did absolutely exceptional last year. Uh, they are also very sweet and they provide the same benefits in the garden as the squash do. Gourds were grown for utilitarian purposes, not for food. They are grown in the same way as squash and pumpkins. So they're gonna provide those same benefits in the garden. They make great containers and water dippers once they have been harvested and allowed to completely dry out, which can take several months up to about a year. Native tobacco was used for ceremonial and medicinal purposes. It is much stronger than smoking tobacco and nicotine content. It would be considered taboo by Cherokees to use it recreationally. We do oftentimes encourage Cherokees who do not have a ceremonial purpose for tobacco to still grow it. And that's because it is a great attractor of pollinators. Uh, bees, butterflies, all of those great important pollinators tend to visit our tobacco in the garden. Hummingbirds are also known to be quite fond of tobacco plants. And we have hummingbirds every single year in the garden that are attracted to many of our native plants as well, but especially our tobacco. The hornworms that oftentimes plague most garden tomatoes are actually tobacco hornworms. So if you grow tomatoes, uh, a tobacco crop will often save a tomato crop since it is the host plant to the hornworms. And generally, since it's a host plant, then the hornworms won't actually do very much damage to the tobacco. Cherokee gardens were known to be surrounded by sunflower crops. Uh, we weren't too sure as to what the sunflower was for a long time, but now we have figured out that the sunflower is actually sunchoke or what is also called Jerusalem artichoke. One plant can produce up to about five gallons of tubers. The tuber can be prepared very similarly to the way that we would prepare potatoes. It is not a potato, uh, but it can be cooked. It has a very similar texture to potato, and it's actually a much healthier alternative to true potatoes. One of our Cherokee clans is referred to as the wild potato clan. While there is a true wild potato, which is pictured in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, we believe that sunchoke was the inspiration for this clan name. Sunchoke tubers do not keep very long once they're pulled out of the ground, unlike potatoes, uh, which is why we don't tend to see these very often. Uh, however, they will keep throughout most of the winter as long as they are left in the soil. So again, it's going to be a great crop to help us get through those winter months when we don't have a lot of natural foraging going on. Many of these seeds are and were hard to come by. Cultivating these plants in Oklahoma summers has proved to truly be a challenge. However, through hard work and perseverance and a lot of luck, we have, have now had a viable seed bank of over 20 plants that have been with the Cherokees for generations. 
On top of that, this led to the inspiration for growing our Cherokee Heirloom Garden and Native Plant Site, where we're able to educate and show um, and provide, in some cases, many different types of Cherokee medicines and food plants that would have naturally come from our environment that are not heirloom crops. Our goal is to continue and expand upon this living history and to pass it on to future generations. What a Kelly, so we are um, standing in my backyard and I, uh, about six years ago, I converted this. This is all just, just invasive weeds. And I converted it to a native plant um, landscape. Um, and it was a lot of work and I had to source all the plants and get it to my watershed unit. And then I had to, you know, water it for five years or so until it established. And now I have the watering off, but um, in the process of doing that, I invested a lot in the garden and, um, you know, this topic of pollinators is coming up and I was like, I want to support pollinators like everybody else. But I decided to not um, have a, a bee box or honeybees in my backyard as a managed bee box mm -hmm. because I fell in love with my native and wild pollinators out here. And I really worried about the honeybees coming and competing for the nectar and pollen resources that um, that I saw the wild bees using, um, and now there's you know growing and growing literature about this in the in the scientific press about possible competition between honeybees and wild bees, and if I'm worried about pollinators, what should I do? Um, do you have thoughts on this about you know the role of backyard beekeeping in um, in pollinator conservation? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think. You know, there's there's certainly a place for beekeeping, clearly. I mean, you know, the honeybee is completely integrated with our agricultural system here. Uh, one third of our diet is really a result of native bees, but largely the honeybee. Um, and I think a lot of people gravitate towards backyard beekeeping or wanting to, you know, have a honeybee hive. And while it's well-intentioned, it sometimes isn't the best conservation tactic. Mm. Um, I think, you know, it can be done well, but it has to be a really careful and responsible decision. You know, you have to think about, first of all, your location. You know, do you have a lot of people around? You know, are there even town or city ordinances about it? Um, but you also need to practice safe and, pra and, and good beekeeping practices, like, um, you know, testing your hive for varroa mite, for example. Mm. Um, what you do in your hive can actually impact the greater honeybee colonies in your area and also the native pollinators as you described. So I think it's a really careful decision that um, one has to make when you're considering this. And you know, also a key thing which you talked about is making sure that there's ample floral resources for all of the pollinators that you have. Mm. The more resources, the less likely competition is going to be an issue. So I think that's really key as well. So the mite, that is what is thought to be one of the causes of colony collapse disorder with um, the Apis mellifera, which is the honeybee. Is that right? Correct. Yep. That's called Varroa destructor. Okay. So this is a mite that um, is invasive. It came from Asia um, and it is definitely one of the biggest concerns in the beekeeping community. Um, and actually, as I mentioned, it can transfer from colony to colony. Mm. So if you're not practicing safe, you know, beekeeping practices, you can impact your neighbor too. Mm. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So like the first cut, if somebody really wants to support pollinators, it might be to just plant native plants versus going all the way to um, having a bee box in your yard. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, native plants 100% are are meant for native pollinators. Some non-invasive, you know, uh, non-native plants can be good too. So mm -hmm. work within your means. But like you said, it is a lot of work. It's a big dedication, but um, you'll see re reward in the native pollinators that you have. And I've never had the wild bee sting my kids. Yes. And the honeybee does have a barbed stinger. So if we're thinking about putting the honeybees in 
yards or schools or whatever, that's a consideration as mm -hmm. well, right? Absolutely, yep. Most native bees will not sting. A lot of them are stingless, actually, and um, yeah, they're, they're less territorial. So mm. the honeybee can be an issue, but uh -huh. usually it's only if it's caught in your clothes or something like that. All right. Um, wow, you guys are blowing up the chat today. Um, that is awesome. Okay, so let's um, let's check out our poll questions and see how we are doing on the polling questions. Um, if you want to, this the poll is still open, so you can still go and and put your your thoughts into these questions. So the first one is relative to other environmental issues, how important is the issue of pollinator decline? So, wow. Okay. So I haven't seen the results. So I'm seeing it live with you. Um, 90. Oh, and you're changing your answers. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so 94% um, said it's very important. And some said somewhat important. And nobody said not important or I don't know. So, wow, that's really interesting, actually. Um, I know a lot of companies do um, polls and surveys with, uh, with their customers around you know what their values are and and what they're thinking about is important from their perspective and of course <laughs> during the pollinator party you know i think there's probably sort of a bias a little bit towards uh putting pollinators as, as super super important of course i think it is i'm a conservation biologist um i can tell you this this is a really critical ecological issue which is why I'm working on it. Um, so that's really interesting. Okay, awesome. So you can keep taking that poll. Let's go to the next one. So question number two, have you ever considered the link between pollinators and social equity? Yeah, this is a little bit, um, yeah, this is a little bit of a different question. And I, it's an issue that have, is of growing in terms of awareness. Um, Frankly, social equity is an issue that's a topic that's becoming, you know, more important um, across uh, certainly the United States. You've seen that by President Biden has an equity initiative and currently um, government grants. If you want a, a grant from a federal agency, you also need to be responsive to this diversity, equity, inclusion or DEI. Uh, requirements when you're requesting federal money. So this is becoming a kind of a more of an issue in some places you could say equity is sort of a hot topic. Of course, it's always been there. It just maybe has more labels now or recognition. But this is really interesting. We talked about this earlier today. We talked about it slightly yesterday during the keynote. And it's going to come up again um, on, um, on Thursday. When we talk about equity, again, we have some real neat um, storytelling for Thursday. All right, let's check out the next question here. Um, uh, okay, can you easily access a natural landscape or community garden? Wow, a lot of people said yes, wow. Okay, that's interesting as well. Sort of reveals a little bit too on um, maybe the uh, walking distance, you know, to a park or a natural area. So that's good. Wow, you guys on this party are lucky. That is lucky. You know, not a lot of people, not everybody, right, has access to a natural area. So maybe you answered yes, even just for your backyard. So that's, um, that's good. I'm not sure if we did that survey, certainly globally, I don't think that would be the same answer. And maybe even um, across you know, di different um, economic groups. That might be a different answer there too across North America. Okay, final, the next question. I think this is a final question. Um, would you consider converting your, your yard or lawn to native habitat? A lot of people said yes. Um, if you were part of the party last year, you would remember that we had a keynote lecture from Doug Tallamy. Um, and you can go and watch that lecture again. We covered this extensively last year about converting lawn into habitat. And he has an initiative called, um, um, was it uh, Down Home National Park or something like that, Backyard National Park, where he showed statistically if every um, backyard or urban, garden, ur urban lawn was converted to habitat, it would be greater than all of our national parks in the United States combined.
So that's interesting. There's great, great opportunity here. So while power companies are sort of thinking about what they can do with the right of ways, we can close the polling questions now. Thank you. Um, also for us as individual people, um, we can be thinking about what we can do in our own spaces, right? Um, all right. So um, boy, the chat blew up today. We have folks from around the world during uh, on this party. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the party. Um, tomorrow we have Be My Honey. So just in the last little bit here, uh, Kelly Rourke and I had a conversation about backyard gardening. So wanted to cover that piece as well as urban gardening. And then what we heard from Feather about some of the Cherokee efforts. Um, there's growing research and literature that recognizes urban gardens and um, having pollinators within even what you might call sort of a concrete jungle is valuable. Ecologically, it is valuable. Um, so you don't have to be just in a nature reserve, right? We can do this even if you live in an apartment on your deck, um, have some native plants um, out there is helpful to uh, particularly invertebrates, right? These insects that fly around and birds um, that, that move across the landscape. Um, so thank you for what everybody's doing. Um, super great to hear the stories about what power companies are doing on their larger landscapes. Don't forget to, we have our art sharing um, that you can share your art. You can join our art contest, post, post your myth uh, questions that we'll answer on Friday. You can re-watch us on YouTube. A lot of questions about YouTube. Uh, go to APRI's YouTube channel, just APRI. In YouTube, you'll see yesterday's recording. This one is going to get posted later today. Um, and keep telling people about the party. We need to reach 2.5 million people this year to keep this party going, right? Um, this is a nonprofit event, um, and we want to keep it going next year. So you can help us by making sure we reach uh, over 2 million people. Okay, shout out, everybody. Thanks for joining today. And come back tomorrow, same place same time and we will do some honey tasting and talk about wild bees and honey bees tomorrow. Okay, that's a wrap. Have a great rest of your day.